Like urban bosses, the reformers said, these companies put private profit over public good. In the late 19th and early 20th century, large numbers of workers were not unionized, did not have representation, could not bargain with their employers. And so if they were in a workspace that was dangerous and they went to their boss and they said, you know, I'm worried about this staircase here because every time I go up, up and down the staircase, the stair waggles and I'm afraid I'm going to fall down and break my head. And the employer could just say, bye, you're fired. And if something happened, say that worker decided to keep the job, to go up and down the staircase, and one day the, the stair broke and the worker fell and broke an arm, couldn't work, what do they get? Nothing. So one progressive reform, if you will, was workers' compensation. And workers' compensation means that a worker will get some money, either from the state or from the corporation, if injured. Unable to make businesses treat their workers with greater fairness, progressives turned to state and local governments. They won new laws to regulate what railroads and other big companies could charge. They placed restrictions on lobbying and campaign donations by corporations, which had often bribed state legislators. But what if a trust did business in many states? Companies like Standard Oil had operations all over the country. To control these gigantic industries, progressives had to turn to the federal government. In the White House, they found a supporter in the youngest man to ever occupy the nation's highest office. An asthmatic child, frail and sickly, Theodore Roosevelt developed into an avid rider, a skilled hunter, and a symbol of everything that was manly about the United States. Whether leading rough riders up San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War, or leading his presidential cabinet on trail rides through Rock Creek Park, Teddy Roosevelt cut a figure that was literally larger than life. He wore a tall black hat, and he strode along with the physical power of a landslide. Never before or since have I been so much impressed by the physical impact of a human being. Hutchins Hapgood. As president, Roosevelt boasted that he would bust America's trusts just like he had killed Spaniards during the war. But Teddy's trust busting was more talk than action. Instead of dividing trusts into smaller companies, Roosevelt tried to regulate them. To address the meatpacking horrors that Upton Sinclair described, Roosevelt signed the Meat Inspection Act which required refrigeration and other health precautions. To control the sale of harmful patent medicines, he backed the Pure Food and Drug Act, which banned false labeling on packages. And to conserve the nation's dwindling forests, Roosevelt placed millions of acres under federal management. But who exactly would administer these new laws and protect the public's interests? In case after case, the answer was the same a federal agency or department. The Meat Inspection Act authorized a branch of the U.S. Department of Agriculture to examine meat packing. The Pure Food and Drug Act created the Food and Drug Administration to approve any new drug for sale. The new national forests were administered by a Bureau of Forestry, which would evolve into the United States Forest Service. Governors of the several states and gentlemen, the occasion for this meeting lies in the fact that the natural resources of our country are in danger of exhaustion if we permit the old, wasteful methods of exploiting them longer to continue. As a people, we have a right and duty to protect ourselves and our children against the wasteful development of our natural resources. President Theodore Roosevelt, National Conservation Congress, 1908. Fighting big business, progressivism helped create big government and cemented the marriage between them both. The federal government had largely been responsible for taxes on imports and exports and for having an army. It had not been responsible for making sure that if people got hurt on the job that they could get some kind of care. It had not been responsible for making sure, making sure that food was safe to eat. That was the national level reform. 
these were new ideas that the, that the government should be involved in those issues. The progressives also turned to the federal government to manage the nation's diminishing share of natural resources. By 1900, the government had sold or given away most of the publicly owned lands in the western part of the country. Claiming to speak for the larger interests of society and future generations, Roosevelt added more than 100 million acres to the national forest system and prosecuted hundreds of violators of public land laws, recovering millions of acres which were placed under federal management. Roosevelt's objective was to conserve national resources for future use. Theodore Roosevelt's hand-picked successor in the White House, William Howard Taft, broke up more trusts than trust-busting Teddy. Roosevelt was outraged. Trusts, he believed, were here to stay. The president's job was to make them fairer, not smaller. So in 1911, Roosevelt announced his bid to recapture the presidency. Since Taft had a lock hold on Roosevelt's old Republican Party, Teddy ran under a new banner, the Progressive Party. No effort should be made to destroy a big corporation merely because it is big. But all business should be carefully supervised, regulated and controlled by governmental authority. Although it was a three-way election, the real race was between Theodore Roosevelt and the Democratic Party candidate Woodrow Wilson, the reform governor of New Jersey. A former college professor, Wilson seemed cold and distant to most people who met him. His handshake felt like a 10-cent pickled mackerel in brown paper, irresponsive and lifeless. He is a spare, ascetic, repressed creature, a kind of frozen flame of righteous intelligence. William Allen White, 1912. In his 1912 campaign, Wilson proposed not merely to regulate the trusts, but to rid the country of them once and for all. Mr. Roosevelt did not anywhere condemn the great corporations. All that is proposed to do is to take them under control and regulation. Shall we try to get the grip of monopoly away from our lives, or shall we not? Shall we say monopoly is inevitable, that all we can do is to regulate it? Then there is no hope for the people of the United States. Calling his platform the New Freedom, Wilson promised to free the United States from the trusts and to restore an older economy of small shops and factories. Roosevelt, Wilson's opponent, called his program the New Nationalism, since it accepted large corporations but tried to make them work in the national interest. So the 1912 presidential election offered Americans two very different visions of their country. They voted for the man who promised to bring back the world of small business, the corner grocer, not the giant corporation. Woodrow Wilson proved to be a very effective president, but he never did deliver on his promise to bust the trusts. He did win passage of the Clayton Antitrust Act, which limited the size of trusts. But he also signed into law the Federal Reserve Act, which created a national banking system. Rather than breaking up big banks, the new Federal Reserve System linked them into a centrally controlled network of unprecedented size and power. Any passerby can enter and use the public lavatories in government buildings, while citizens of color, who do the work of the government, are excluded. As equal citizens, we are entitled to freedom from discrimination. Have you a new freedom for white Americans and a new slavery for your Afro-American fellow citizens? God forbid. William Monroe Trotter, 1914. The same man who declared a new freedom for the United States ordered the segregation of black Americans in federal buildings. Back in 1896, the Supreme Court had upheld the separate but equal laws of the American South in a case called Plessy v. Ferguson. In the years that followed, racial segregation hardened throughout the South. Across the nation, the signs of segregation appeared over hotels, theaters, and water fountains. 
worst of all, this era also witnessed a new and vicious outbreak of violence against black Americans. Between 1885 and 1907, more Americans were lynched in the United States than legally executed. The vast majority of the victims were black. One of the underlying issues that made racism uh, violent and dangerous in the early 20th century was that most black people were powerless. So in the early 20th century, even though there was a great migration of black southerners into the north and into the east, about 90 percent of black people still lived in the south. In the south, almost none could vote. They lived in a situation of segregation, which meant separation, but it also meant separate and terribly unequal.